Welcome to the Church of God International here in London. We are always very pleased to welcome you here. Well, good afternoon, brethren, and once again, thank you for joining us here at CGI UK, Church of God International. Thank you for allowing us into your personal space as we search the Word of God together. What a blessing it is to be able to participate in a commanded day of rest, a commanded day to you know, rest from the daily grind in whatever way, shape or form that, that affects your personal life. It's a day to reflect, a day to rest, and it's a day that we can fully focus on worshipping our God. A commanded assembly, even in these days of lockdown, eased or not, most of us can still assemble together. If not physically, we have the blessing of assembling virtually. So thank you very much for, for joining us here today. Now on that note, for those who, who may be watching and who are unaware, CGI UK have a fellowship discussion around 2.30 uh, or so, where we normally discuss the sermon or anything else surrounding biblical issues. And I have been reliably informed that by the, the powers of technology, there should be a link on the screen for those who wish to join us to either listen or to take part in. Whatever way, everyone is welcome. So as you can see, the topic for today's message takes in the subject of understanding the Kingdom of God and how we as Christians, how we should be preparing for it. And I'd like to clarify that by Christians I'm referring to those who have been baptised, have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and therefore keep the commandments of God. They keep the holy days of God. They keep the Sabbath. Yes, we know there are many who have a good Christian attitude. That, that's without a doubt. You know, good, sincere people. But let's be clear that God gives his Holy Spirit to those who obey him. And he says, if we love him, we keep his commandments. So for those who say we are Christians, you know, bear with me. Please bear with me. Because after looking at the reality and understanding of the coming kingdom of God, we shall look into the spiritual mirror and ask, how am I? How am I who calls ourselves or myself a Christian? How are we preparing for it? Indeed, one may ask, do we need to prepare? Do we need to prepare for the, the coming kingdom of God? As I was putting this message together, many ideas sort of pop into your head, sort of deliberating how, how was I going to structure it. And in doing so, I started to reflect upon this year, 2020. And to say it's been a year that will live long in the memory would be an, an understatement. And before I go any further, I'd like to thank my brother in the Philippines, Pastor Mel Arsinas, for some of the information I'm going to give you regarding world events that have taken place so far this year. You know, just, just a few moments ago, a few months ago I should say, the world welcomed in a new year with all of the usual festivities. And as with every year, it was full of expectation. But while the celebrations were taking place in Australia they were suffering from some of the worst bushfires in living memory or even in, in their history millions of hectares of land destroyed uh, 33 lives were lost over a billion animals were killed and thousands more lost their homes in fact January the 1st epitomized the shape of things to come 
On January the 6th, a 6.4 earthquake hit Puerto Rico. Guatemala, Mexico, Japan and the Philippines all experienced dramatic volcanic eruptions. Indeed, many in the church had plans to actually visit the Philippines for the Feast of Tabernacles, which is coming up shortly. However, the volcano that, ex that was erupted, the Ta'al volcano, is in the, vo in the vicinity of the feast. Initially, it was touch and go due to the effects of the ash and the general disruption in the area. You know, would the feast go ahead, would it not? But ultimately, all plans to host the feast were quenched when the coronavirus reared its ugly head. But God's people will still be observing the feast as instructed, but this year it will take on a different look than normal. But the command to observe will still be adhered to. So January continued, and in doing so we had an Ebola outbreak in the, Dominion, uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And again, while all, th all this was going on, the aforementioned coronavirus was making its way out and about. And here in the United Kingdom, in January, what was the main news here? What was the main news in January? Well, the volcanoes were thousands of miles away. Likewise, the bushfires and Ebola. But here, all the talk was about Brexit. Remember Brexit? As we prepared to leave the European Union. We talked about nothing else in this country for three years. It was Brexit this, Brexit that. And how that argument stirred people up. So the year was hardly out of the starting blocks and it was obvious that 2020 was was making its presence felt. Planet Earth was getting a real good shake up. And here we are, it is now July 2020. And most of the world is gripped by COVID-19, the coronavirus, and the fallout that still emanates from it. So as a Christian, no matter where you were in the world, there were and there are major distractions, major distractions all competing for your attention. Biblically speaking, we are commanded to watch. We're commanded to watch world events. And we as Christians must continue to walk that narrow path and not get distracted from the walk to which we have been called. But that is easier said than done. Consider how much more difficult, brethren, is it to walk the walk, to walk the narrow path. If you are, or when you are even, directly affected by a major trial, Consider those in Australia losing homes to house fires. Losing a loved one in an earthquake or a deadly disease. Whatever it might be that affects you individually, your emotions are under attack. On a purely physical level, any major trial consumes you. Of course, we get lulls in the storm. But by and large, a, ma a major trial has the ability to smother you, even if not directly affected personally. And, 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 and major events that circumnavigate the globe, they interrupt normal life with the fallout or the byproducts thereof. And we with God's Spirit, we have the same struggles. We have the same struggles as our neighbour. And if we're not careful, we can and some are buffeted spiritually. Doubts may creep in as to why. You know, why if I'm a Christian? Why am I experiencing these things? Why am I why am I, why am I being affected by what's going on? But brethren, there is a difference, and that is we have a comforter in the form of the Holy Spirit. The comforter, the Holy Spirit, gives us peace of mind in the expectation in the expectation that all God has promised in his word will come to pass 
We take comfort having the understanding of his promises, of which some are the resurrection of the dead and the coming kingdom of God. And it's here that I'd like to review what the Bible says about the coming kingdom of God. Because with the help of the Holy Spirit and like-minded brethren, this is where we need to focus our daily lives. This is where we need to focus our daily lives. And for those of us, sorry, for those of who may have stumbled upon us for the first time on, on Facebook or wherever you're viewing us, and for those who are set in what one may call traditional Christian beliefs, let us turn to Matthew 6 to, to set the stage as we see in this part of the message and look to understand the coming kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 Jesus says pray then like this our Father in heaven hallowed be your name verse 10 your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven brethren this verse here tells us all we need to know in what you may call um, a snapshot Christ tells us we are to pray for the kingdom to come in order for the will of God to be done here on earth as it is in heaven and this is the first and most fundamental thing to understand about the coming kingdom of God it's coming to earth the kingdom of God is coming to earth and all that God wills to happen whilst he is in heaven in accordance with his word that's going to be done here on earth so let me briefly paint a picture to get a glimpse of what this kingdom will look like but in essence keep in mind as I read the scriptures that foretell of a future time a time when the kingdom of God will be here on the earth and the changes that will take place it is a time of restoration from a world that is evil it is a change of a world that is now evil to one that will ultimately become pure Let's turn over to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 2 verse 4 Isaiah chapter 2 verse 4 so when the kingdom of God comes to the earth, how, how, what, will it, what will it look like? Verse 4 of Isaiah chapter 2. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war any more. This short verse, brethren, restoration, a world without war, a world without war. Weapons of war will be turned into instruments for good, and this is coming. Men will learn to love their neighbour as themselves. There's precious little of that anywhere in the world today, brethren. When the kingdom of God comes to earth, what else will happen? Well, those who are afflicted with illness shall be made well. The deaf shall hear again. Those who are disabled will be restored to full health. Again, restoration. Let's look at Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35 and verse 5 so when the kingdom of God comes to the earth verse 5 says then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy what a wonderful image that conjures up the lame man shall leap like a deer the mute singing for joy, the deaf hearing again. What about ag agricultural land? When the kingdom of God comes to earth, the agricultural land which is abused today 
will also be restored. Crops are plenty. Trees likewise will bear fruit in abundance. In fact, all the blessings that result from obedience will be, well, they'll be, they'll be the norm. Rain in due season and the blessings will be self-evident. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34 and we'll just jump into the middle of verse 26. Ezekiel 34 26 says I will send down the showers in their seasons they shall be showers of blessings. Verse 27 and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit and the earth shall yield its increase and they shall be secure in their land. Again what a wonderful image of a, of a coming kingdom of God. And, and something else to consider, you know all those TV appeals that we see asking for three pounds a month or whatever it is to help those impoverished because they don't have clean water. What happens when the kingdom of God comes? Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 17 says when the kingdom of God comes, verse 17 the poor and needy, when the poor and needy seek water and there is none and their tongue is parched with thirst, I the Lord will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land, and there's plenty of that brethren today in certain areas of the world. The dry land springs of water. I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle and the olive. I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain and the pine together, that they may see and know, may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this, the Holy One of Israel has created it. This is a future time brethren, a future time in the kingdom that God has promised will happen it's a wonderful time to to pray for thy kingdom come God's word does not leave his mouth and return void and our God cannot lie he has said it and it shall come to pass and it will all come as a result of being obedient to God's law which as we saw last Sabbath the law has not been done away with And when the kingdom of God comes to the earth, one other thing, Isaiah chapter 2 verse 3, when the kingdom of God comes to the earth, many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Come let us go up. Let us be taught in his ways that we can walk in his paths. Out of Zion shall go, shall go forth the law. So brethren these are just a few illustrative scriptures of what the coming kingdom of God will look like. And we'll say without stating the obvious who wouldn't want to live in a world like that? I want to, uh, to draw our attention to this most fundamental topic because in just over two months time God's people will be celebrating the Feast of Trumpets. It's a feast that we celebrate in obedience to God and it is a day that will be fulfilled in reality in the future as the trumpets blown usher in the returning Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God to earth. There are many scriptures in the Old Testament that prophesy of the kingdom of God, such as in Daniel, Daniel, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, where it is clear that God's kingdom will never, sorry, will be set up never to be destroyed, and it shall also 
in being set up it shall consume all other kingdoms here on the earth we also see scriptures that prophesy of the coming kingdom of God in Isaiah Jeremiah and, my, and Micah it's not my purpose to go through every scripture but a kingdom is coming that will be on this earth and it is a kingdom that will be driven by the law of God a kingdom that will re-educate the masses now referring to matters in the church of Corinth the Apostle Paul reminds the church of their future in 1st Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2 he says do you not know that the saints shall judge the world and if the world shall be judged by you are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters now the church in Corinth had its problems but, but Paul is reminding them that part of our future that as saints as those belonging to Christ we shall be judging the world in the future and if we look at Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10 we see a wonderful scripture where it says that God has made us or has made us unto God, our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth this is the future for, the, for, for God's people we shall become kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth and as kings and priests we will be teaching this is the way this is the way Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 21 the scripture says and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying this is the way walk in it when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left so brethren this is why the kingdom of God is needed because the world around us has rejected the very one that created us and as we lose sight of loving him and as we lose sight of loving our neighbour as we go along doing what is right in our own eyes anything that is not of God the Bible defines this as sin and because of sin the world is reaping what it has sown when the kingdom of God returns the world because of sin will be on the brink of total failure total collapse and we know the scriptures that tell us what would happen if those days were not shortened so if the days weren't shortened then what what would happen but the days will be shortened as Matthew chapter 24 verse 22 says except those days should be shortened there should be no flesh saved that's what would happen if there was no intervention by Christ returning as King of Kings but for the elect's sake brethren that's us we are the elect for our sake those days will be shortened I don't need to labour the point but because man has rejected God and rejected his laws the world is in chaos man makes laws that are an abomination to God and the result will be a slide to self annihilation times are coming brethren that will make this COVID-19 this coronavirus times are coming that are going to make that look like a walk in the park as God's people we are to cry out and spread the gospel of the coming kingdom of God a coming kingdom that is so far removed from today's world that it cannot be compared that words cannot adequately describe the the difference but as we spread this gospel it is increasingly falling on deaf ears 
It's so obvious that man, for all of his brilliance, is unable to bring peace. Man, for all of his brilliance, is unable to bring harmony. We've had the League of Nations. We've got the United Nations now. And sure, again, we have lulls in the storm where we deceive ourselves that everything's okay. Proverbs 14.12 says, There is a way that seems right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. death. And we deceive ourselves. Everything's kind. It's okay. Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yeah, you know, we deceive ourselves, brethren, that everything is okay. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Everything's not okay. The wages of sin is death. That's what we in the church, and for those who God is calling, that's what we understand, and that's why we walk a different walk. We're on a different path. But we have to live in this world, which is becoming increasingly difficult. You know, if it's not one thing, it's another. We have countries waging war on each other. Then there are numerous types of conflict in, in one form or another. And to put it politely, what's manifest is not a pretty sight. In fact, it's downright ugly. And we here in the West, we've almost totally lost our way from those Judeo-Christian values that were once, not that long ago, once held in such high esteem. Satan has been allowed because of the pride, self-righteous attitude of man. He's been allowed to deceive us. We make up the rules. Us wise human beings, we make up the rules according to what's trending at the time. What's in vogue or what's, what's fashionable. And Satan has stirred us up to the point where chaos is rife. Chaos, hysteria, people running around like loose cannons. And this is all the tip of the iceberg. This coronavirus, COVID-19, I think it's exposed us to seeing ourselves to be how vulnerable we all are. Planet Earth was effectively shut down wholesale shut down. There wasn't a, and isn't a country not affected by this disease. And we've all been affected and some of the byproducts of, of just being cooped up for most people day after day feeling oppressed. The byproducts are men and women fighting in supermarkets over basic supplies. And then as time goes on, if that wasn't enough for us to sort of take on, we're just kind of getting used to it. We adapt to this lockdown. If that wasn't enough, then we are exposed to global riots. Riots breaking out across the whole world. If it's not one thing, it's another. 2020 is leaving its mark. So from bushfires, Volcanoes, earthquakes, Brexit, and its related issues. Ongoing wars in various places and global riots. Is it any wonder why that we with God's Spirit should pray, Thy kingdom come? Do we not long for that time where righteous judgment will be carried out? When loud mouths that stir up hatred with their twisted opinions and rhetoric will be stopped. Brethren, if it's not in line with the word of God, their opinion, these loudmouthed people, their opinions or persuasive arguments 
they don't matter to God. Their opinion isn't valid. And if it doesn't matter to God, then we must take care that what is contrary to God, it doesn't tickle our ears when these arguments are shouted out rather loudly. The world, brethren, is broken. Because of sin, the world is broken. And if we are indeed praying, Thy kingdom come, should not our walk reflect that of one who would be accepted into that kingdom? And it's here that I want to focus on, on our preparation for the coming kingdom of God. So we've seen a few scriptures that show what a wonderful world this will eventually be. And we've seen that the coming kingdom of God, man will be re-educated. A broken world will be restored. Please think on that. Please think on that. Let us reflect on the calling we have accepted. And as we reflect on our calling, as we, ref we reflect on the on the coming kingdom of God. Ask yourself, how, how am I preparing for it? How am I preparing for the coming kingdom of God? Again, some of us will hear the arguments. What are you talking about preparation? God loves everyone, yeah? God loves everyone and everyone's going to be in his kingdom. They, they are the arguments. Matthew seven twenty one says differently. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. That's the criteria of being in God's kingdom. He that does the will of the Father. So it's not a given, brethren, that because we love the Lord, because we are decent people, that there will automatically be a rite of passage. Godly character is required. The gospel message of Jesus Christ, the good news of the coming kingdom of God, was the focus of our Lord and Saviour's message. And there are numerous scriptures that show that Jesus Christ came preaching the good news of the coming kingdom of God. The numerous scriptures, and let's just look at two or three here. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23, Matthew 4 23, we read, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Jesus Christ teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 14 to 15 we read, Now after that Jesus was put in prison. This is Mark 1 verse 14 to 15. Now after that John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent repent you and believe the gospel repent and believe the good news of the coming kingdom of God and in Luke chapter 4 verse 43 Jesus Christ said I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God for I was sent for this purpose so that's the focus of his mission that's the reason why he came sent for that purpose to preach the good news of the coming kingdom of God. So as we prepare, we see that we must repent and believe in the coming kingdom of God. And repentance leads to doing, with the aid of the Holy Spirit, the will of the Father. And brethren, that's fundamental in our walk, doing the will of the Father. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 36 Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? 
verse 37 and he said to him you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind this is the first and great commandment and the second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself and on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets love the Lord your God with all your heart that rolls nicely off the tongue doesn't it but scripture brethren says that if we love him we keep his commandments if we love him we keep his commandments do we? do we keep his commandments? scripture also says if we love him and not keep his commandments we are liars are we? are we liars? it's not my intention brethren to sound heavy or have a heavy tone but the scriptures themselves reveal the criteria for one who is preparing for the coming kingdom of God and in the light of the world around us and all that distracts us if we are pulled away by our own desires or a desire to plead the cause for whatever it may be we should also be distracted by the sound of spiritual alarm bells going off in our head if something is distracting us that is not, the word, not in line with the word of God then pray that by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit in you spiritual alarm bells ring otherwise you're going to be distracted and go down the wrong path because living in an almost godless society brethren it brings many challenges to the Christian and the world that we live in is changing at an unparalleled rate of knots and it's in the light of this that uh, I would like to give us or like us to have deep thought to our calling as we prepare for the kingdom how does God see you? how does God looking down on us individually how does he see us? and for those who know that you are a Christian how does your neighbour view you? how does your neighbour view you? the Christian I'd like to look at three points that again we should reflect upon for, the, for, for us who are preparing for the kingdom of God I'd like us to look at our citizenship I'd like us to look at our conduct our Christian conduct and our conversation what do they mean for a Christian preparing for the kingdom of God In John chapter 14 verse 6 we read Jesus said Jesus said to him I am the way and the truth and the life no one comes to to the father except through me and Christ is saying he is the way Christ is the example and Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1 that we should be followers of him that's Paul as he followed Christ in other words we should be striving to walk in the footsteps of Christ as laid down by his perfect example in the scriptures so let's look at the first point in our kingdom preparation that of being a citizen a citizen of where? where is our citizenship? Uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 17 Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17 we read Paul writes 
brethren, be followers together of me. Be followers together of me. And mark them which walk, so you have us for an example. So Paul, he is writing to the church. To make note of those who strive to live as he did. I.e. imitating Christ. Because they are a good example. In verse 18. For many walk, Paul writes, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Again, make a note. Make a note of those who are good examples and those who strive to live us, to live as, as he lived. Because there are many professing Christians amongst us who are the enemies of the word of God. How, how did that happen? How does that happen? How do you call yourself a Christian but under scrutiny you're seen to be an enemy of the cross of Christ? How does that happen? It's not the world around us, brethren, against the word of God. Could those people who have been mentioned by Paul, enemies of the cross, could they have been tarnished by the world around them? And for us, do we not live in times where the, world, where the word of God is ridiculed? Do we not live in times where the word of God is mocked? And do we not live in times, brethren, that if we do not keep our eyes on the word of God, if we are not led by God's Holy Spirit, we too shall drift away. Because we are going to be taking on ungodly character. Verse 20 of, verse, of chapter 3, Philippians. Paul writes, But our citizenship, those who call yourselves Christians, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a saviour, the coming kingdom of God. We await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 20, the word citizenship is taken from the Greek polytuma. It's 4175 in the Strongs. And this word citizenship can also be translated community, conduct, and conversation. As such, if we belong to a heavenly community, our conduct and behaviour should reflect that of one striving to imitate the Son, through whom, as we read in John 14 verse 6, through whom we have access to the Father who is in the heavenly kingdom. Our citizenship is in heaven, and our eyes must be firmly set on seeking first the kingdom of God. Yes, we are of the world, you know this, we are of the world but we are not supposed to be part of it. Our citizenship is in heaven. We live in the world, but not to be part of it. Christianity is a way of life that we committed to upon repentance. It's a way that we committed to upon repentance, baptism, and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. And it's a way of life that is guided by the Word of God. It's not guided by the spirit of the world, which certainly shouldn't be. A Christian's life should be guided by the word of God, not by the spirit that's in the world. Not guided by the signs of the times that may seduce us. Now we need to get the balance right. Of course, of course, of course, we can have strong opinions on all manner of things anything, we can have strong opinions on anything that we see in the news. From Brexit, good old Brexit, we can have strong opinions on that. So miscarriages of justice and all things in between. We can shake our heads, we can spiritually sigh and cry as long as we remember that our conduct must stand out 
as one who belongs to another community. Our citizenship is in heaven and our actions should reflect that. James writes in chapter 1 verse 27 that we should remain unstained from the world. We must live our lives, as I just said, as citizens, citizens of a heavenly community. We don't sink to the, the, uh, the level of the world around us. And in these hate-filled days, we are living in dreadful times. Uh, so we have lulls in the storm, but the days are growing worse and worse, brethren. And we need to rise above the noise. We need to rise above that. We need to love our neighbour. We need to pray for our enemies. And we don't get involved with the name calling and the throwing insults that is so prevalent today. We are not of this world because our citizenship is in heaven. Let's move on to the second point now about, about our conduct. So our citizenship is in heaven so how should our conduct be? In Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith the gospel. Paul writes that our manner, our life or our conduct, which is more accurately translated, our conduct must reflect that of the good news of the coming kingdom of God. Again a coming kingdom where all that is in the here and now, it's going to be turned on its head. As we, as we saw in the opening scriptures, a world to come that will usher in right government, truth, justice, peace and harmony for all. But that's not coming any day soon. And we know that the scriptures point to things getting a lot worse. And, and the more that we see, well the more that we see the world around us degenerating, the more our individual lives become affected by man's perverse law and it's going to get harder to live according to the manner of one being called and we must by the power of the Holy Spirit we have to stand firm it's easy to say oh, I'm a Christian when all is rosy in the garden but it's different when things are tough it's easy to slip when we don't have someone watching us but as Paul writes, he wants the church in Philippi, and by extension, the scriptures are there for our example. We have to live worthy of the gospel, with or without a teacher looking over our shoulder. We need to live worthy of the gospel without someone babysitting us. We're not children anymore for those who have been in the faith for many years. So let's look at one technique that we can employ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse 14, we read, we read that the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit or the Spirit of God because they are folly to him and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. In verse 15 we read that the spiritual person judges all things but is himself to be judged by no one. So the spiritual person judges all things. So if we say we belong to God, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 15 again. The spiritual person judges all things but is himself to be judged by no one. 
the word there for judges is anacrino which means to to scrutinize properly to investigate to interrogate by implication that is and to determine to ask questions discern examine and judge so brethren if our conduct or our conversation is to reflect that of one identifying with the kingdom of God then we must be disciplined to scrutinize ourselves by using the Holy Spirit so under under scrutiny how do our actions show that we love God under scrutiny under the microscope how do our actions show that we love our neighbor note that Paul writes that the natural man those without the Holy Spirit and cannot accept the Word of God because it's just folly to him it's ridiculous but let me tell you brethren the natural man is very quick to point out when you as a Christian step out of line why because they're scrutinizing you you who call yourself a Christian they think you're ridiculous and they're very quick to point out when you step out of line and very quick to to uh, point out when you you stand up for the truth they're very quick to jump on you because they dress up what you say as hate speech because it doesn't fit an agenda but standing up brethren and standing fast and applying good character good godly conduct good behavior in difficult times is what's required we cannot for example get caught up in the ways of the world you know through just pointless arguing just pointless debates healthy debate is good but you know in debates where it's just they're just pointless and you get yourself stressed out what's the point of all that for example just getting back here to the UK Brexit again sorry to keep mentioning Brexit but that shouldn't be the focus of a of a British Christian's way of life that shouldn't be the focus of their conversation or for anything else around the world whatever else may be trending large at any particular time that shouldn't be the focus of a Christian's daily conversation especially when it has the has the uh, ability to bring out the worst in you who call yourself a Christian that's what you have to scrutinize yourself what else brethren in the weeks months years to come what else may happen to grab your attention what else is in danger of shifting your focus indeed what else else is in danger of shifting my focus so that's what we have to do we have to focus on the Word of God we have to focus and stand fast because we are, we are going to be in grave danger of making an idol out of whatever it is whatever hobby horse that consumes your time your thinking you're going to be in grave, grave danger of making an idol out of that anything that comes between God and yourself puts us in danger of making an idol out of something do you, do you feel aggrieved do you find yourselves waging in, in a war of words words that are not befitting one who is a Christian happens happens to all of us that's why we need to scrutinize ourselves we've all been affected by 
so many things but our conduct must reflect that of one who is in preparation for the coming kingdom of God we can't be seen as one who uses language that betrays us as Christians we can't be in danger of being so obsessed with the events that go on in the world that they end up pulling you away from the word of God but brethren don't uh, don't misunderstand me there's a difference between getting caught up uh, and entangled in the world to being observing and watching we are commanded to watch it doesn't mean that we cannot be analytical it doesn't mean that we don't observe and scrutinize them and scrutinize world events but proceed with caution discern and scrutinize yourself to ensure that you are not being dragged away from the focus of your calling which is the kingdom of God we need to be mindful of how we are perceived again by the kind of language we use just be careful we are ambassadors for Christ but, but we are ambassadors for Christ in a godless society and watching what we say if we're not really using a God's Holy Spirit it's going to be harder to control because we're still carnal and we still have real feelings that tug at our hearts and minds in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 the Bible talks about days towards the end these godless days as being perilous times I've often thought how does one live according to the Word of God when if you think it's bad now we haven't seen anything yet how will we converse and act as citizens of another land when the world that we live in the land that we live in implodes further and further into the abyss are we going to join the crowd are we going to have that attitude of you know every man for himself the ship's going down every man for himself or will we use the Holy Spirit to guide us are you drawn away from the Word of God or do you find yourselves being drawn away from the Word of God when you might hear an eloquent speaker arguing for ungodly courses of action are we drawn away from the Word of God because the ungodly arguments by these eloquent men they might be seducing our carnal nature are we drawn away by that old man that we buried at baptism when they push for law changes that sympathize with that with which we buried that being the old man at baptism does that old man fight to make a reappearance so how can we overcome feelings and emotions that pull at your carnality in 2nd Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5 Paul writes that we have to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ when we bring ungodly thoughts into captivity it means we're having the right focus and we have the right focus by maintaining a deep relationship with our Father we bring ungodly thoughts into the obedience of Christ the one who is seated at the right hand of the Father where? in the kingdom of God of which we claim to be citizens of we discipline our thoughts and our conversation bringing everything to the obedience of the Word of God in the book of Jude we see that Jude writes that we must contend for the faith contend brethren by making sure 
that the ungodly ways of the world and stay out of here and they stay out of the church there's no place for the world in the church of God as such let us be mindful of Satan's devices he's very clever let us be mindful of Satan's devices let the body of Christ be galvanized so that we provoke one another we're all walking the same path are we not let's provoke one another stir each other up to, con to conduct ourselves as citizens of heaven and watch what we say because if covid coronavirus has taught us one thing it's that things can change in the blink of an eye and the challenges that have come just from this trial and will continue to come through other trials must be met head on in a godly fashion and to that end we must be grounded in the scriptures we must be grounded in the word of God brethren once more back in 2nd Timothy 3 after Paul warns Timothy of the perilous times we read in verses 14 to 16 we read this 2nd Timothy chapter 3 verse 14 Paul writes continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of continue in them continue in that which you've learnt and you've been assured of knowing of whom you have learned them from and that from a child you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise holy scriptures that make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus verse 16 all scripture is given by inspiration of God we know that to be God breathed so all scripture is God breathed and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction and for instruction in righteousness these words brethren just these three verses here these words should be jumping off the page if we have our focus on the kingdom of God and if we hold the light of the word of God up against the times that we live in these scriptures should be jumping off the page the scriptures make us wise unto salvation all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and doctrine brethren being grounded in the scriptures doctrine is critical for us we must increase our understanding of God's word and be rooted in it we must know what God requires of us we must study in order to show ourselves approved again if we don't then we are in danger of falling away and that's happened once or twice in God's church people have fallen away because they're not grounded in the scriptures let's increase our understanding of what it means to practice the Lord or to practice loving the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul let us understand more increase more what it means to love your neighbor as yourself in these hate-filled days brethren love your neighbor as yourself love your neighbor as yourself the book of Titus in chapter 2 is a spiritual gold mine for giving us direction as to the importance of doctrine in Titus chapter 2 verse 1 we read but speak you to things which become sound doctrine so, so here we see this is important speak the things which become sound doctrine verse 8 sound speech our conversation sound speech that cannot be condemned remember those those people who are going to be looking at you and jumping on you when you when you put one foot out of line 
But Titus is saying, let's, let's have sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary, uh, of the contrary part, may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour Jesus Christ well these are great scriptures brethren the importance of sound doctrine the importance of sound speech that cannot be condemned the importance of denying ungodliness and denying ourselves worldly lusts these things that are pulling at us constantly at the moment and we should live soberly righteously and godly as we wait for the coming kingdom of God that glorious appearing of our Saviour Jesus Christ the world brethren is so easily stirred up and if we've got one foot in the world then I suggest we've got one foot in the grave the spiritual grave if we are still clinging on and viewing the world around us with carnal eyes then I'm afraid we are going to get caught up in the distractions that go with it I'm reminded of the scripture in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 where we are told to lay aside the sin which so easily ensnares us we need to lay aside that sin which so easily ensnares us what's the sin in your life that so easily ensnares us what sympathies do you have with the world that upon scrutiny is against the law of God you feel yourself being drawn to it because you're so easily ensnared by it we got zero chance brethren of doing that if we cannot recognize and practice keeping the old man buried we put our old man away at baptism we are told to lay aside the sin which so easily ensnares us we haven't got a chance of doing that if we cannot recognize and practice keeping the old man buried I'm just repeating that for emphasis. The world around us, it's in turmoil, isn't it? it the world is around, it's, it's just in turmoil. And if one was to list all that is, is wrong and evil, where, where would you start? Where would you start from A to Z? Incredible. The, the amount of things that were, how, how evil this world is. The fallout of evil especially in today's climate it's designed by Satan to stir you up stir you up stir me up and stir, stir the world around us up but brethren we have to recognize that all sin is against God so if we feel aggrieved by something if we feel wronged by something if we have a strong emotion that when you scrutinize it it's really not godly at all but sinful recognize that sin is a transgression of God's law it's not our fight we've been called out of the world we, we are, our citizenship is in heaven we've been called out of this world and we have the promise of a wonderful kingdom to come so brethren, I hope that we have a better understanding of just how awesome and perfect the kingdom of God will be when it is established here on the earth. It will be as far removed from what we experience now than can be imagined. But we don't have to imagine. The pages of your Bible will tell us explicitly of the restoration that will be coming across the spectrum. And we, through the power and conviction of the Holy Spirit, we can see it coming 
but brethren let us be in a state of readiness let us be in a state of preparation for the kingdom of God the scriptures advise us to hold fast the scriptures advise us to endure and they are left for us by divine inspiration Matthew 7 21 not everyone that says to me Lord Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that does the will of my father which is in heaven Jesus Christ came brethren preaching the good news of that coming kingdom repent and believe stay repentant and believe stay repentant and live it repent and prepare for it seek first the kingdom of God we read earlier God has called us to be kings and priests who will rule with him I want to be there and I'm sure you do as well and we are in training for the again for the coming kingdom of God we are citizens in training of that kingdom as such in these unprecedented times let our conduct and our conversation reflect the same endure to the end brethren endure to the end I wish you all a very very happy Sabbath Amen